Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Chapter One Read Aloud. Today, I am reading yet another book that will be in our upcoming virtual book fair that will happen about mid-May. Look for more information about those dates shortly. Today, I'm going to read you the chap first chapter of a historical fiction novel. Remember, historical fiction are books that the story itself is not real, but it's based on historical events, on events that really happen. So this particular book, The Bicycle Spy, takes place during World War II. And for those of you who are fans of World War II or Holocaust fiction, this particular book doesn't take place in Germany, though. It takes place in France, because remember, World War II happened all over Europe, not just in Germany. So, Marcel loves riding his bicycle, whether he's racing through the streets of his small town in France or making bread deliveries for his parents' bakery. He dreams of someday competing in the Tour de France, the greatest bicycle race. But ever since Germany, Germany's occupation of France began two years ago in 1940, the race has been canceled. Now there are soldiers everywhere, interrupting Marcel's rides with the checkpoints and questioning. When Mar then Marcel learns two big secrets, and he realizes there are worse things about the war than a canceled race. When he later discovers that his friend's entire family is in imminent danger, Marcel knows he can help, but it will involve taking a risky bicycle ride to pass along covert information. And when nothing ends up going according to plan, it's up to him to keep pedaling and think quickly because his friend, her family, and his own future hang in the balance. So historical fiction is one of my favorites, especially World War II historical fiction. And I love getting the perspective of the other side of the war. So in other words, instead of just focusing a story on Jewish prisoners or uh, the Jews during this time, this is somebody who wasn't Jewish. And again, not in Germany, it's in France. So see what he was witnessing through all this. So here's chapter one of The Bicycle Spy. A gust of wind cut across Marcel's face as he cycled furiously down the street. He was riding as fast as he could, and he pushed even harder on the pedals of his trusty blue bike. But the bumpy cobblestone streets of Ossian were not exactly made for speed. Still, he had to hurry. Just a little while ago, his mother had come into his tiny room, and with its narrow iron frame bed, desk, and old armoire crammed in the corner, demanding that he get up and run his errand, this errand for her. She said it was very important. Can't it wait, he had said. It's so cold out. It was late Sunday morning and he and his family were back from church. He was warm and cozy under a small blanket, reading an out-of-date magazine about French-born about French born René Vietto, the second place winner of the 1939 Tour de France. No, she said, it can't. You have to bring this loaf of bread to Madame Trottier right away. Her tone was unusually stern. But with a big sigh, Marcel set aside the magazine, ran his fingers through his mop of curly hair, straightened his tortoiseshell glasses on his nose, and reached for his jacket. He'd have to finish the article later. Ever since Marcel had gone with his cousins and father to see the tour three years ago, he'd been practically obsessed with the big bicycle race and was looking forward to seeing it again. Riders from all over the world participated in the grueling competition, which was broken up into stages and went on for dates. But in the spring of 1940, Germany invaded France. And shortly after that, the German army marched into Paris. The Tour de France had been canceled indefinitely. Now it was 1942 and the occupation had dragged on for two long years. Who knew how long it would last or when the race would start up again? The bumpy cobblestones made the bike shake, but Marcel wouldn't let that stop him. He knew that in 1939, the spring classic Par Paris bicycle race included 15 or more cobbled sections as part of the grueling 200 plus kilometer course. Some were even steep hills. He had just rounded the corner of the street where Madame Trottier lived when he suddenly, when suddenly a shriek of orange flashed across the road. Look, alors! He, he jammed his feet on the brakes hard and swerved just in time to miss hitting a very large ginger cat. The cat looked annoyed, but not especially alarmed. What a relief. He would have hated to be responsible for squashing a cat on the cobblestones. He liked cats. His parents kept a pair of tabbies in the bakery over which they lived because they were good mousers. Sometimes when his mother wasn't looking, he would feed them scraps from his plate. They would lick his fingers with their rough pink tongues and purr almost too softly to hear. The ginger cat padded away unharmed, but a girl darted out into the street and scooped the cat up in her arms. She had blue eyes and black hair plaited into two tight braids. Under her gray coat, he could see the hem of her dress, which was also blue. Bad kitty, he said. You could have been hurt. Is he okay? Marcel asked. He thought so, but he wanted to be sure. It's a she, said the girl, and she's fine, thanks. Still cradling the cat in her arms, she walked away. 
Marcel stood staring after her. He'd never seen her before. Maybe she was new in town. She looked like she was around his age, and she was pretty. Not that he cared about stuff like that. He wasn't interested in girls. He thought they were bossy and gossip too much. Also, they cried at the least provocation. And not one of them, he knew, had the slightest interest in what he considered the most important thing in his life, cycling. But why was he even standing here thinking about it? He promised his mother he'd hurry. And if he didn't, she would be annoyed. He loved his mom, but he didn't have it. But she did have a tendency to nag about cleaning up, washing his hair, helping out in the bakery. Moms were like that. When he finally reached Madame Chartier's house, he'd been pedaling so hard that despite the chilly day, he was sweating. Merci, she said, taking the bread for him. Tell your mother I appreciate it very much. I will, said Marcel. He pedaled home more slowly, passing the street of shops that lined the street. Butcher, cheese store, greengrocer, cafe, and on the corner, bakery. On the other side of the street was a store that sold clothes, another that sold hats, and a third that sold toys. That one used to be his favorite, but now that he was 12, he was a little too old to stop in anymore. There was also a tailor, a tiny shop that sold used books, and the town's old church, St. Vincent de Paul. He passed a few other people on bicycles as well. Bicycles were just a part of life here, and a good way to get around quickly. People young and old rode them almost everywhere. The only thing that was unfamiliar in all of this was the presence of soldiers. When the Germans had invaded France, they swarmed all over Paris and lots of other cities in the north. Marcel had seen the headlines <clears throat> in the newspaper and heard about it on the radio that Papa kept on a table in the front room. Ossian, however, had been in the free zone since the invasion in 1940. That meant it was not occupied by Germans and they had not seen many soldiers here. But in the last two weeks, that had all changed. On November 11th, the Germans invaded the free zone too. And now soldiers from France and even Germany had started to appear in the town square or at the market. Oh, excuse me. He also noticed more gendarmes, police patrolling the, patrolling the town. The French soldiers were belted olive green jackets and helmets. In the other circumstances, he might have admired them. But given the presence of the Germans and the gendarmes, they made this little village seem like a strange and scary place. A lot of other people thought so, too, and quietly cursed the soldiers when they were not in earshot. People said that they were working hand-in-hand -hand with the Germans and, which, and called them collabos, which was short for collaborators, whatever they were called. Marcel feared and distrusted them. He wished they would all go away. He slowed when he got to the bakery. His mother was outside, scanning the street for him. Did you deliver the bread? Yes, and Madame Trottier said to say thank you. Only then did her expression soften. Good. Thank you for getting it to her. I'm going to keep on riding for a while, she said. He said. His mother nodded and went back into the bakery. She seemed so anxious lately, more so than usual. He wondered what was wrong. But when he'd asked, she said she was fine. The bicycle bumped along and Marcel reached the end of the cobblestones. When he was able to pick up speed, soon he was outside the town, pedaling faster and faster still. The houses rushed by and the trees arched overhead. Only a few dried leaves left on their tail branches. But one day, he could actually ride in the Tour de France. He'd be speeding along, just like this. As he rode, the red roof houses gave way to farms and pastures in which he saw horses, cows, sheep, and pigs. For a few seconds, he imagined the road lined, not with animals, but with crowds of spectators, cheering them on as he flew along to victory. Then he had to slow down for a gaggle of geese crossing the road, their noisy honks echoing in his ears as he passed. That ended his dreams of the Tour de France, at least for now. After a while, he grew hot and tired, so he let the bike slow to a stop and hopped off, flopping down the dry grass. He would rest here for a few minutes before heading home. Marcel was small for his age and not the best cyclist either, and he wore glasses. He didn't like being the smallest kid in class, the one who got picked on and teased. He couldn't do anything about growing taller or needing glasses. Those things were beyond his control. But he could get stronger and faster. He could. That was why he vowed to try to ride every day, to build up his speed, his endurance, and his strength. Then the other kids would think twice about teasing him. And that was what the Tour de France riders did. He'd been reading all about them. Most recently, the entire race course was 4,224 kilometers. You had, to work up to a dis you had to work up to a distance like that. Of course, the race was divided into stages of a certain number of kilometers each day to make it possible to finish. There were 18 stages in all. He also learned that the cyclists had to develop special strategies like eating certain foods and taking vitamins, all in an effort to improve their performances. Marcel reached for his canteen, took a long drink, and climbed back onto the bike. 
he still felt bitter about missing what was now three years of the race. It was another reason to resent the Germans. His parents shared his resentment. They detested the occupation, which had brought the soldiers here. It also brought rationing and shortages of food and gas, and his parents especially detested Adolf Hitler, the leader of the German people and the man responsible for the invasion and the war. But what could they do about it? Not a whole lot. As Marcel headed back toward the town, he came to a small bridge where a French soldier stood patrolling. Under his helmet, his expression was stern. The gun slung over his shoulder looked big and heavy. Mm, that's the end of chapter one of The Bicycle Spy. So if you are a historical fiction fan, especially World War II historical fiction, I highly recommend that you purchase it at our upcoming virtual book fair. That's it for chapter one read aloud. See you next time.